Welcome to another Talking History with Humphreys and Reid, with me, military historian Paul Reid. And me, Victoria Humphreys, author of Historical Fiction. I change my job title every week, but we'll go with that this week. It's always interesting to see what you are this time. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome everyone, and welcome again to uh, uh, our two esteemed guests. I'm going to pass over to Victoria to, to do the introduction here. But she set this one up again, and it's a fabulous story, full of fascinating twists and turns. And thank you both for joining us. Well, I mean, obviously, as I was just saying before the programme started, whenever we speak to Nemini, I feel like we should have her on record because she has so many fascinating stories, more than one person's, you know, lifetime stories, to be honest. Um, but when I was reading your um, memoir, and it's important to go back to the beginning and Obviously, with your memoir, we covered Hitler and, you know, proving that Hitler died in the bunker. And we've done that in a previous programme. But the kind of other beginning is, is your late husband, Jimmy O'Connor's story and um, particularly his kind of time in France and his surviving the sinking of the Lancastria, HMS Lancastria. And I wondered if we should start there, perhaps. Fine. If you want to just give us a brief overview, then, Emily, or, you know, tell us about his story there. Well, Jimmy um, was a London Irishman. Um, he came from what was affectionately known as County Kilburn because of the large uh, Irish population there. His family were stricken with poverty. His father had f volunteered and fought in the First World War, but had come back so disillusioned and disgusted what queen and country or king and country demanded that he swore he'd never work again. So he lived um, really a life of poverty, which was very hard on the family. He had four children. Um, he married another, an Irish girl called Annie, Anna Maria Ball. They had a Maria who was born in 1914. Jimmy, born in 1918. Timmy, I don't know the date of, but Timmy was slightly younger and the youngest was K Kitty or Kathleen. Um, the two youngest children died in childhood, which was uh, infant mortality was enormous in those days. Uh, Timmy died of tuberculosis and Kitty of meningitis. The uh, Maria survived, Jimmy survived, but they lived a really staggering, poverty-stricken childhood. Jimmy um, used to do four or five jobs to really to put bread on the table. He supported the family from the age of about 12. Um, he would get up very early. He would do a newspaper round. Uh, a milk round and a round for the local chemist. And then he would arrive at school at nine o'clock in the morning, absolutely exhausted and sleep at the back of the, co uh, of the car class. Um, he became a petty thief, which was hardly surprising. He uh, always said the only way out of the ghetto, and this was an Irish ghetto, was either by boxing or by crime and he chose the option of crime. But it was petty crime, it was petty theft. Then when war broke out, he um, volunteered. He went uh, with the British Expeditionary Force to France. He, he volunteered for the Air Force at Verso, didn't he? he? He was turned down by the Air Force. Yes. And then he went to the army. Yes. Why was he turned down? Why um, was he turned down for the Air Force, do you remember? I'd forgotten that, but you're quite no. right, yes. But anyway, he went to France and he was in France for a year. This was pre-Dunkirk. I mean, he joined up as soon as it was possible to do. His father was very angry with him and said he'd um, cut his arms off. He said, well, who's going to put bread on the table? Who's going to look after your mum? It never occurred to him that he might look after Annie himself and the younger children. But anyway, when he got to France, he met up with um, some old associates from London 
and they found a wonderful way of of. of Onto Lancaster, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. What so, is it? No. Get to the Lancaster. Yes. 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 I, I'm yeah. getting there. Yeah. Um, they found a wonderful way of liberating the commissariat, and they stole an awful lot of goods from the army. I mean, lorry loads of, of um, cigarettes and beer and food, and uh, they made a small fortune. Then when the Germans uh, advanced in 1940 and swept across Europe, the phony war was over, and part of the army went east and was evacuated from Dunkirk. The rest of them went west to the Atlantic coast and with a lot of civilian refugees. And there they joined the Lancastria, which was a, a p &O cruise ship, which had been commandeered as a troop ship mm -hmm. at the beginning of the war. And they joined the Lancastria, which at that time was moored at Le Havre on the Atlantic coast. And Jimmy and a little lad from West London uh, joined. Jimmy had been, um, in fact, he'd already received a wound. He had uh, been hit by a shell and he had a, um, a septic arm. He had a high fever septic arm, but they boarded the ship and uh, with some of the money that they had appropriated, they managed to buy a cabin and Jimmy went into the bunk and the little lad slept on the floor. Then in the middle of the night, the ship um, slipped its anchor and sailed into the Atlantic where it was bombed by German bombers and torpedoed. And it sank within about 20 minutes. And Jimmy, who was asleep in his bunk at the time, suddenly woke up and saw the, the door in the ceiling. And they realized that something was very wrong, rushed upstairs onto the deck. And there people were running from side to side of the ship, trying to uh, balance it. And, but it, it went down. And Jimmy said to the, the little lad, jump. The little lad said, but I, I can't swim. He said, just do doggy paddle. Pretend you're in the serps or the serpentine. But the poor little lad was drowned. He was pulled under the ship by the undertow. And Jimmy, who was a very strong swimmer, managed to strike out and get away from the, uh, the undertow, which was a dangerous thing. And he was in the water for 12 hours. Wow. Meantime, the German fighters were circling over the ship and machine gunning the survivors in the, in the sea. And also setting fire to the oil which was spilled on the top. So those who were not shot were burned. And, but Jimmy managed to survive by the grace of God. And in the end, he, he swam away from the ship, uh, a dinghy, with survivors on it, passed by, and he said, can I join you? Can I get aboard? And the chap who was uh, the ad hoc captain of the dinghy said to him, sorry, mate, we're full up, just like a grumpy bus conductor, and uh, repelled Jimmy with an oar. But anyway, in the end, Jimmy was saved by a minesweeper after 12 hours. And he was pulled aboard. Cambridgeshire. Cambridgeshire. Oh, after that, yes, there was a ship called the Cambridgeshire. He was mm. transferred from one ship to the other and put ashore at Plymouth on the English coast. He was stark naked and um, had this septic arm, quite feverish. But he ran down the, the foreshore and he smelt something delicious. And it was a stall selling something like hot dogs or sometimes Cornish pasties. Cornish pasties, that's it. 
and he seized the tray of Cornish pasties and rushed back to the boat which had rescued him and distributed the Cornish pasties um, to the crew. They were highly delighted with that. But the red caps, the military police saw him and they arrested him, <laughs> of course. And so he was taken off, but he was in fact taken to hospital mm -hmm. because he was quite badly injured. So he was arrested for theft of the Cornish pasties after all of that. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and then he spent a couple of months in, in a hospital. And then when he was sufficiently recovered to be discharged, he was told to go home and wait for uh, call-up papers, wait for further orders. So he went home to Kilburn, but um, he heard nothing. So he went back to a bit of thieving and he went round the um, West Country thieving with another associate. Um, at one stage, he was in the West Country. He and his mate robbed a jeweler shop in Bath. And there they stole, among other things, small bits and pieces. It wasn't a, a grand shop. It was a modest small jewelers. He's, they stole a gold, old hunter watch and chain which played a very important part in his story later. Then he went back to, um, to Kilburn and there during the, this was by now it was 1941. During the spring of 1941, while he was still waiting for his call up papers, there occurred a burglary and a robbery and a murder in Kilburn. There was a man called George Ambridge, who was a scrap metal merchant, I think, but he lived alone in a small flat in Kilburn. And one night he was robbed by burglars and he received a head injury, which killed him. Now, later on, a receiver of stolen goods accused Jimmy and said that he had uh, bought a gold watch and chain from Jimmy, which had been stolen in this robbery. This in fact wasn't true, but Jimmy was arrested. He stood his trial at the Old Bailey. He met his counsel for the very first time on the morning of his trial. His counsel was in fact, a, a Labour MP called Hector Hughes. He was the MP for Aberdeen. And he met him for the first time on the morning of his trial. And Hector Hughes and the solicitor, who was an East End solicitor, said to him, um, there's no evidence against you, laddie. You walk out of this. And Jimmy said, but, um, you know, are they going to hear about my war record? I went to France. They said, well, no, you, you can't give evidence because you'd have to admit to having been a burglar and that will condemn you in the eyes of the jury. So we strongly advise you not to give evidence. And Jimmy gave no evidence and was duly convicted. He was condemned to death. Um, he was taken to Wandsworth Prison where he spent Pentonville. Pentonville, Pentonville, yes, to Pentonville prison where he spent two months in the condemned cell. Meanwhile, the officer in the case who was a DCI Thorpe was had a touch of conscience. I think he was worried about the, the case because the evidence was dodgy to say the least of it because the main witness against him was tainted in that he was a receiver of stolen goods and a man of very bad character. And he went to the Home Secretary and said, we have doubts. There is a problem with this case. And 
two days before he was due to be hanged, which would have been his birthday, his 23rd birthday, he was reprieved. But um, the Home Office took the view that he should do a life sentence just to teach him a lesson. So off he went to Dartmoor, where he did spend the best part of 11 years. He had a, a short stint in Pentonville, but um, he, he did 11 years, which was uh, considered the correct tariff at that time for a life sentence of the, for a crime of this type. While he was in the condemned cell, he wrote to the Home Secretary and told them that the watch and chain, which the receiver of stolen goods had um, spoken about and said that Jimmy had sold to him, in fact, had been stolen from the jeweler in Bath two months before the murder. So that really clinched it. Yeah. And later the jeweler was interviewed and he was shown the watch and chain. And he said, well, we carried stock of this type. I can't actually identify this as the watch, but we did carry stock of this type and it could well have been one of mine. Anyway, while he was in prison, Jimmy did a course in drama with Ruskin College, Oxford, and he started to, he had basic literacy, which he'd managed to pick up at school, but he started to write. And without very much success, the um, tutor at Ruskin told him that he must learn to speak and write proper English. There's no good writing in the vernacular. And he mustn't write such violent and unpleasant stories. And then Jimmy thought this was a lot of rubbish. And he, in fact, quoted Bernard Shaw, who said, um, those who can do and those who can't teach. <laughs> and he said to the tutor, well, well, you'll still be teaching correspondence courses to old legs when I'm driving down Sunset Boulevard in a beautiful white limo. <laughs> anyway, so he was sacked from this uh, course, but he did go on to become an extremely successful playwright, but with difficulty. In fact, um, when he came out of prison, he was, um, he made a documentary or helped the BBC make a documentary about prison life called Beyond the Gates. And so he got into contact with the BBC and he was allowed to attend rehearsals and give technical advice and help with the casting and so on. But um, on one occasion, he was told that the former governor of Wandsworth prison, who was called Fred Lawton, the father of the High Court judge, was in the building and was going to attend the rehearsal. And Jimmy, Jimmy's presence would embarrass him. So Jimmy was told to leave. So he left and what he said was, fuck the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> um, him. I don't want any more to, to do with these people. Yeah. But the, I will backtrack for a moment. For, for a time, he was transferred from Dartmoor to Pentonville, where the regime was much um, easier. And it was a much more enlightened regime. Dartmoor was a really old-fashioned, appalling prisoner, which had in fact housed prisoners after the, um, the war between America and Britain in 1812, which ended with the, with the Treaty of Ghent. And there is still at Dartmoor a graveyard, which is known as the American Cemetery, where the American prisoners were buried when they died. Oh. Quite interesting. They're buried. Uh, the, an another slight digression. The, um, there were about 1,200 um, black prisoners 
Afri uh, Afro-Caribbean prisoners among, in the, among the Americans. And at the end of the war, the white prisoners were repatriated to America, but the black prisoners were sold to the British government. 1814 or something. Yeah, for some uh, mm. ridiculously small sum. And of course, a lot of them ended up in, in, um, in, in Dartmoor. Oh, gosh. I that's a I don't know. Jimmy, what is it you want to no. say? Sorry, Victoria. No, I was just saying, I've never, ever heard of that before. Have you, Paul? Are you aware of that? Yeah. Not that story, no. It's a very interesting one, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's disgraceful, isn't it? I've got yeah. the exact number yeah. in the book of prisoners that, um, mm. did, that did... were sold. Mm. Yeah. It was quite a large number, and they, they, they fetched some very low figure. Do, but do you know that that Emily, beyond when they were sold, who were they sold to? What were their fates? What did they do? Well, they really worked as slaves, I suppose. Just just here this is yes. a story that needs to be i mean it may have been told I, the fact that i'm not aware of it doesn't mean it hasn't been no. told. No. Yeah. Yeah, well, i don't think uh it's the, not long then, is it? that particular war is very much taught taught in our schools it was a dispute between the states and about the canadian border right. it was a territorial fight and it ended with the trend treaty of ghent That's and right. the sale of the Black Americans was part of the treaty. And that was a disgraceful incident, mm. which I think has been largely covered up. Sounds like it. Like I say, not because I don't know about it, but to have absolutely no knowledge of that, that's, that's you know, that's that is disgraceful. We should know about that, shouldn't we? Of course we should. Mm. But I mean, when when I went to school, I was unaware and we weren't taught about the potato famine in Ireland. Well, yeah. And it wasn't until um, Cecil Woodland Smith wrote that book, The Great Hunger, that anybody knew about it in mm. England, really, mm. except a very few people with Irish connections. Yeah. I think that war... It's been a lot uh, of rewriting of history. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that War of 1812 is, is known very much in Canada because it obviously directly affected them. Yes. They have, they have memorial sites to it there, for example. But uh, the kind of British involvement in it, a lot of men who fought uh, the French in the Peninsula War went to fight there against uh, the Americans alongside the Canadians, which, of course, was still part of the wider empire. I don't think it, is, it was a dominion status at that, at that point. So it's an interesting period. But the, the, involved, the, the capture of black American troops and their imprisonment and then style is, is, is an incredible story. Yes, they probably, a lot of them were probably... Um ex-slaves who'd been recruited rather like these Wagner people in the Ukraine who Putin has recruited from Russian prisons. Right. Possibly, yeah, with, with, no, with no kind of say, I mean, they had no say in most of what they did anyway as slaves. So uh, uh, from, from the fields to the battlefields probably wasn't too much of a, a leap in the minds of their, their, in inverted commas, owners, I would guess. Mm. No, no. Just going back to what you were saying earlier about Jimmy and, and Lancaster and being in France, I mean, you very kindly sent me some pictures, Milo, which a couple of those relate to this period. So I thought we might have, have a quick yeah. look at some of those. Um, there's there's that one for, for example. Um, yeah. Just if I can get that full screen. There we go. Yes. Uh, which shows him in uh, with the cat badge of the Gordon Highlanders there. Which oh, is that's what it is. I didn't know that, Paul. Thank you. So I it's, how, why he was entitled to wear that. Uh, well, uh, what's interesting is because he was he was a similar age to my father. My father was born in 1919. I think Jimmy was born in 1918. Yeah. yeah. And I know that um, in September 1938, when the Germans invaded the Sudetenland, the British government decided to pre-register people for military service because they knew a war was coming. Uh, and a lot of men of that generation, my father and possibly Jimmy as well, then registered for military service. And in those, because of the kind of experience of the Great War and the POWs, battalions and whole communities being thrown into mourning, you kind of had no choice where you ended up, you know, because my father tried to join the Royal Navy 
um, and was rejected because his father had been at Gallipoli in 1915. He said, don't join the army. I've seen him get massacred on the beaches and so on. Uh, but they just, you ended up where the, where the war office kind of, or whoever sent you. So that could explain why, you know, someone of Irish ancestry living in London ended up in the Gordon Highlanders. It's kind of, it's kind right. of like, and that probably, almost, uh, Paul, that probably uh, explains why he's rejected for the Air Force. Possibly, yeah, possibly. Because they, they kind of almost socially profiled people and they looked yeah. at what their skill sets were. And if they didn't think that you had those skill sets to go in a particular branch, then, you know, you didn't go there. So uh, yeah. whether you volunteered or, or not. Um, so that's an interesting one. And then these, I would guess, are probably taken in France during that period. I mean, the Gordon Highlanders were part of, they certainly had battalions in the 51st Highland Division, which, you know, as you mentioned, when the, the Germans launched their blitzkrieg, the BEF got split up and a whole group of those Highland soldiers ended up in Western France and Southwestern France rather than Northern France going to Dunkirk. And, and they went to exactly where you described, across the wards. Some went up to the coast, got cut off at St. Valery. Others um, made their way further west and went into, into Normandy. Um, and those are the ones, a big chunk of them, got off on ships, including the, the Lancastria. And there was this great one of them in his... Yes, they, there were more casualties when the Lancaster sank, um, sank than the total number uh, from the Titanic disaster and the um, Lusitania combined. Wow. It's extraordinary. I mean, there were... Nobody knows the exact number. The ship was licensed to take something like... 3,000 passengers, but they think that about 9,000 crowded on board, refugees and British personnel. That's yeah. right. It was a big mixture of people. I mean, the, yes. I think the accepted figure of, of, of loss is over 4,000 killed. But like you say, they, they can't really ever verify this because there was no loading lists. No one kind of checked anybody off on a list. They just no. got everybody on board. And, and when it went down, there was no way of saying who was where. Yeah. yeah. And it was it was such a bad, the, the bomb, the eyewitnesses say that two bombs hit the ship originally from the Junker, and one went straight down the funnel and went straight through to the hull of the ship and blew the hull out of the ship. That's why it sank so quickly. But the hull of the ship was meant to be full of RAF personnel. So yeah. it's, it's an unimaginable scene of horror. Yeah. Um, there was, I, I spoke to my dad about it often and, you know, just said to him, how do you survive? And like most people who've been through uh, an unbelievable trauma, he didn't talk much about it, but he did, he did have a sense of humour. He was a wonderful man, a very um, a lovely, <laughs> lovely sense of humour. And he said, I knew we were effed when I saw the door on the ceiling. And he didn't talk much, but, but one of the eyewitness accounts I've, I've um, I heard a few accounts. One of the very moving things was um, one of the guys took a, um, um, a stain gun up onto the um, pile of the ship when it overturned and um, fought the planes off who were trying to strafe him in the water. And he stood with a brain gun, it was, it was a brain gun, and uh, he fought the planes off for as long as he could and only stopped fighting when the ship disappeared from beneath his feet. Gosh. Amazing. Gosh, yeah. And the um, Minister of Defence has always refused to recognise the place where she sank as a war grave. And the only official uh, monument is in Scotland, on the Clyde, where okay. she was built. Yeah, there's one in San Jose. In, yes, yeah. but the only one in the UK mm. is in Scotland. And that was um, uh, built or, or dedicated largely through the efforts of Alex Salmon. Why, why, why have they refused to acknowledge it? But it was um, Churchill, because um, Dunkirk had been such a success in terms of evacuation, oh. um, when Lancaster sank, he just said, we can't take any more bad news today. Right. He said, you know, enough. We can't have any more bad news today. So he put a D notice on and said, we're going to black it out and we're not going to talk about this. 
Um, the public can't take this because their public will just think we are, you know, we're, there's no way back from this. Um, and the, the story goes that he's just forgot to remove the denosis. But I think they, they just said, listen, we just don't, you know, the public doesn't need this. Well, it never was removed. No, it? that's the point. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, the date was the, the 17th of June, 1940 which is just over 10 days after the last evacuations from, from Dunkirk. So that, the way that things filtered through the press at that time, that's still very much the kind of talk is uh, the miracle of Dunkirk and, and the victory mm. of Dunkirk and trying to find victory within what was an obvious defeat. And then to hear about this kind of scale of disaster, which is probably what the Admiralty feared Dunkirk would have been anyway, but yeah. by a miracle it wasn't. Um, like you say, it was too much, but I think it robbed uh, the families of those who, who perished in that incident the chance to really confront it and and, and recover if, uh, as much as you can ever recover from it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, I completely understand why Churchill did it, because um, I think if you look back at that point in time, I think defeat seemed a very real prospect. It, uh, I, don't, I think a lot of people think, how can we win this war? The German war machine is is is, is efficient and, and awful, and it's and we're not ready for this. I think that was the feeling. So it's a go, go away, lick your wounds, and just try anything to come back from this. Well, yes, that was the Munich uh, generation who had defeated their their hearts from the very start. <laughs> I just um, I remember a story from your memoir, Emily, where you said that. Jimmy had amassed quite a fortune in France. Now, if I remember this correctly, he had it in a briefcase. Was it handcuffed to his wrist? Yes. Tell us about that. Yes. Um, the He had amassed a, a really considerable fortune through the uh, liberating the commissariat with his mates. And he had had a, um, a, a belt made with pockets for currency and also um, uh, he had a briefcase which was attached by a thin chain to a handcuff on his left wrist and when he went down obviously he had the belt on and he had the handcuff uh, on his wrist and the money in the briefcase well during the night in those 12 hours he was in the water the um, the briefcase was swept away by the chain was broken and the briefcase swept away by a wave and when he was pulled from the sea onto the minesweeper he could, he was so thin by this time it mean that the belt just slipped off his lines and went down to the bottom of the sea yeah and but it's so sad when you tell it because i think you do such an amazing job of really showing the poverty that he grew up with, that sense of being absolutely starving all the time. Nobody cared, no welfare state, nobody cared about him or his siblings or his his parents. And so, you know, it, it's easy for people to be judgmental about, you know, this life of petty crime. But actually, when you read that account, you're just really rooting for him to kind of just, you know, make they make the money get the food because it's, it's never about riches it's literally just about filling your stomach with some food and yeah. I, it was St Ignatius who said it's better to steal than to starve absolutely so there's a real sense of this is about survival and even then you know you could think well okay he's taking money from uh, or products or whatever from the army but you know that he's just going to go home and, and, and use it to kind of feed his family. And, and I remember feeling so sad when I read about that loss, because um, unless you, I mean, obviously, I've, I've, I've never known what it's like to starve, but I think you do a great job of showing that kind of destitution and, and desperation. Um, it was really sad. Yes. And I mean, Jimmy wasn't um, a thief at heart. Because after he came out of prison, he never, ever offended again. Mm -hmm. He never committed another crime. Yeah. The rest of his life, he made a lawful living. Yeah. And did very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's very clear that it's not, it's not done in malice. It's, it's just the way it had to be in order to survive. It's survival, yes. You're right. 
Yeah, so uh, just wanted to kind of remember that, if I'd remembered that rightly, it's an amazing story. So if we go back to um, the BBC and the kind of beyond the, beyond the gates, so that was a play that Jimmy wrote that the BBC produced, but they had him on board to kind of advise how he, how he his vision, I suppose, ensure his vision was, um, you know, that it was done correctly. Uh, but then what happened after that? What after after the the plays? Yes, that with well, this, the yes, this was uh, the golden age of the Wednesday play, right? And he worked. Um, there was a very good team of people who were really liberated to to write and do what they wanted. There was no control, no censorship. Um, so Hugh Green was a very good chairman, I think, of the BBC, and he allowed enormous freedom to his, his people. Uh, the team was headed up by James McTaggart, and the principal uh, director, of course, was Ken Loach. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy and Ken Loach formed an extremely fruitful partnership. And Ken directed six of Jimmy's plays, and they were the very first uh, play in the Wednesday play series was a tap on the shoulder, which was about political corruption. So it's highly relevant. It was a tap on the shoulder. It's what the police do when they arrest you and what the queen does when she, the king or the queen do when they honor you. And then he was asked what he would, what was closest to his heart to write about. And he said the death penalty. And he wrote Three Clear Sundays, which had a colossal impact. This was um, written at a time when the whole question of the death penalty was under review. The parliament has, had suspended the um, death penalty while the Homicide Act was debated. Um, the Homicide Act was a very curious hybrid piece of legislation, which uh, put murder into categories. So certain categories were capital and others were not. Uh, it was a capital offense to kill a police officer, a prison officer, anybody in security, um, to kill anyone in the course of an armed robbery. But it was not a capital offense to kill a child. Mm or to kill your, your wife. It was there, and it was obviously so um, illogical and unfair that in the end, Parliament took the view of the, let's get rid of the whole wretched thing. But it took until 1969 to abolish the death penalty. Mm -hmm. It was a long, long, hard fought battle, which really was um, started by, well, obviously a lot of good people had always been um, opposed to the death penalty, but the people who started the final campaign, which led to success, were Arthur Kerstler, Victor Gollex, and Canon Collins, the, um, the peace campaigner. And they s said that they would raise public consciousness and get it abolished within 10 years, and they did. Mm. But Jimmy's play was one of the final uh, bullets in their armory. It got an audience of 13 million, and the impact it had was absolutely staggering. I remember um, an old cousin of mine who was well to the right of Genghis Khan in her politics, um, and she lived with the former Ken, mayor of Kensington and Chelsea. And um, she, they were converted. They were absolutely horrified by the, um, the cold blooded taking of someone's life. You know, it's one thing to shoot a terrorist on the tarmac, but it's another thing to take him out and kill him yeah. in a prison cell. I mean, it's, it's unimaginably appalling. Anyway, 
um, it had a colossal impact. And Nancy Bank Smith, who was the one of the leading critics at the time, said that Jimmy was the most important writer to come out of prison since Bunyan. And I'm so proud of him. And what did he think about that? Oh, he took it in his stride. <laughs> <laughs> he thought this was fair. <laughs> Do you have any, I mean, have you got the play with you? Is there any bit of it you'd like to read at all? Um, it's it's available on YouTube. Um, uh, and it is, I'd recommend anyone to uh, go and watch it. Um, it It's a great demonstration of why it is so barbaric. Um, because I, without any spoilers, um, it gets to show how somebody from poverty, especially, can get themselves into a situation, um, you know, especially being young and naive, where they face uh, the death penalty. Yeah. Um, and I and, and people howl about the death penalty. You know, every time there's something awful goes on in the world, they say they should bring this back and bring, and it is just barbaric. No civilized society should ever have the death penalty. There's no justification. Prevention is the is the answer. It's not about you know the state murdering people. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I, I'm I'm incredibly proud of him because um, it, it's a timeless message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll we'll put a link to that in the uh, the show notes for this uh, for this video right. so people can can find that. I mean, I, I know this is something we've discussed previously about the way. Um, Men like Jimmy, who went to prison, were given a, a long custodial sentence then. Prison gave them a way of reforming themselves. It gave them an opportunity to, to do that. And he came out the other end of it with a completely new life, a completely new direction, and no desire to ever offend again. And, and again, I, I think that's part of the story here and where that resonates to, to present day, really. Yeah, absolutely. He fell in love with um, he fell in love with um, books and educating, and he made a real effort. But he was given the access to enable himself to do that, and so he came out fitter and stronger. He was a terrifically strong man, um, but he also came out an intellectual powerhouse. And we spoke about the um, you know the value of education, which yeah, some kids, of course, you know, <laughs> the parents among us, you know, we all sometimes struggle to. <laughs> Um, get our children to understand why it's so important, but it's something you take with you forever. It doesn't matter how little money, if you have no money, if you have knowledge, is power, is to be informed is a wonderful thing. And he he recognized that immediately. And he and he came out and I think when we go through the tough times of our life, you know, this was a guy who'd been blown up in a worse naval disaster. He'd been really badly injured by um by a shell. Um went you know was condemned to death went spent 11 years in category a, came out and had a really successful life because of the knowledge he acquired and that's it tells you what you need to know right yeah definitely and it kind of feels as if that might be missing from the prison system today well i think uh, i think we've gone backwards in our penal policy um sentences are much much longer now nobody until George Blake ever got 40 years mm -hmm. in those days. Um, of course, the, the heavy dramatic offenders were just hanged. But um, I am really shocked when I see people getting 30s and 40s for things which really don't merit. At the time that Jimmy was incarcerated, he became quite friend friendly with one of the prison commissioners who said that anything over 10 was a waste of time. If you were going to change a man, 10 years was enough. And after that, it was just a waste of public time and money. And of course, the prisons now are so overcrowded that the chances to receive an education, except in one or two prisons, um, is much less. I haven't heard of anybody getting a, a degree from Ruskin or anything recently, um, who, which Home Secretary was it who said that um, prisoners were not to receive books? Well, one of the recent mm. Home Secretaries. 
not Michael Howard, but some other idiot. Um, I mean, Jimmy at least, Dartmoor was an appalling place, but it had a good library. Mm. And Jimmy, for a time, had the job of librarian, prison librarian. And the writer who really sparked his ambition or his confidence in himself was Kipling. And it was that wonderful poem, Danny Diva, that got him writing. You know, they're, they're hanging Danny Diva in the morning. Can it's a brilliant poem. It, Lemmy. Can you recite it? I bet you can. <laughs> <laughs> I can't recite it. But, um, but it, uh, it's, absolutely, it's extraordinary. I, I quote it at length in the book. I don't yeah. know whether I can if you can find it. it. Wasn't your grandfather friends with Kipling, Mum? Uh, he... Uh, he was a friend of Kipling's father. Okay. Uh. There you go, another story. This one will be coming yeah. on every time, Lemony, and just kind of find you stories. <laughs> but of course, Kipling grew it in the vernacular. Mm. People forget that. He's a uh, barrack from Ballads. And, oh, oh, yeah. and for some reason, he's been condemned for being an imperialist and so on. But he was much more than that. He was a deeply human man and a very anti-war man. Mm. After he lost his only son in the First World War. And, and thanks to him as well, actually, because of the loss of his son and because of his knowledge of, of people and culture within what was then the British Empire, the decision to replace the grave markers in the cemeteries of the First World War from wooden crosses. Originally, they were going to just replace them with stone crosses, but he knew that not every man was necessarily a Christian because mm -hmm. of his travels. And he put forward the idea of a, what he called a memorial tablet, a headstone, which is what was adopted. And, and that then enabled men from multiple cultures and religions to be commemorated equally, because the only religious symbol was what was engraved on the stone, not the shape of the stone itself. Wow. I didn't know that, that's brilliant. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Well, Lemony, we've talked a lot about Jimmy, but I always feel like when we talk to you about your relatives, we don't really talk about you, and that's not fair because your story is amazing in its own right. We'll we'll go to the law stuff in a minute, but you you're you're a writer and you also uh, wrote plays for the Wednesday Play. Is that is that right? Yes. Could you tell us about that? Um. Yes. Well, it happened. Uh... At that time, Jimmy and I were living in Greece when I could no longer practice at the bar because of our marriage. Uh, we went to Greece and we established a home there. But of course, uh, all the guys from the BBC came to stay one, one after another. And one of them was Tony Garnett, who was the one of the script editors of the Wednesday play. And he... Um, he came out and stayed with us, and he was working on one of Jimmy's plays. He was another close associate of Ken Loach. And he said to me, you've got some interesting stuff to, to tell about the, the law. Why don't you try and do a play? And so he um, asked me to, he, to do a page. I did a page, and he commissioned my first play, which was the Portsmouth Defence. And I went on and did a legal trilogy. And then I did various other things. But um, it was due to the, that wonderful team on the Wednesday play that I got going. Hmm. What were your plays about, let me just said a legal trilogy, but what were you trying to achieve with those plays? What was your message? Of the laws and ass. <laughs> <laughs> No, they were they were critical. I mean, they were they were comedies. The Portsmouth Defence was um, about um, a milkman who gets robbed in the middle of the night. It was about the hardship suffered by a prosecution witness, and um, it's the Portsmouth Defence. It, it's um, the defense is by a, a street robber who says, um, 
I didn't intend to rob him, but I met this man in the night. He made a homosexual advance to me. He touched me on the trouser leg and called me darling, is what I say in the ports of defense. So I took his wallet to teach him a lesson. And that was in ports of defense because it was very, very fashionable in seaports where there are a lot of sea. Uh, and in my play, I have the judge saying, the seaports of England are crawling with people who rely on the ports of defense. So it was about this. And um, then I, I went on and it was about, uh, one of my main characters was a, a crooked solicitor from the East End, who was based on a real man. Um, and yes, I mean, they were satirical plays really about the law. Mm -hmm and the pomposity of some of the people at the bar. And what was the reception amongst your peers? Because obviously you were no doubt in touch with your former colleagues, etc. And what, what was the reception? This mixed, <laughs> very mixed. Um, some people liked it, some people were, well, I was ostracized. Right. But the, um, the people who's, the person who's uh, most unkind about them was John Mortimer. And I, one day at the BBC, I, I met John Mortimer in the lift and he attacked me. He said, your stuff is disgraceful. You're bringing the Lord into the system into discredit. And, you know, you shouldn't be so angry. It's a wonderful, perfect system. And you know, he really trashed my plays. And then, of course, he went on and wrote Rumpo, which was colossal success. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Because really, you should have said to him, I'll take that as a compliment, because, you know, in writing, that's what you need to do, isn't it? You're challenging these kind of ideas all the time. It's OK yeah. to do that. Obviously, he felt incredibly threatened by you. I'm sure he had lots of issues. <laughs> well, yes, well, I, I was astonished. Mm. Mm. But there we are, and then I, you know, I went on and wrote episodes for other companies like Granada. I did Crown Court and mm. various different things. And how did that compare to your? We'll get to your career as a barrister, but how did that compare to that life of law, the writing versus you know you as the as the barrister or the lawyer? Well, I really loved the bar. Yeah. Um, Writing is a very lonely thing, as you probably know. Yeah. You do it alone and you have no idea what sort of reception you're going to get. Yeah. Um, the bar every day is exhilarating. I mean, I wouldn't want to do tax law or something dull like that, but um, the criminal bar is really fascinating. And you get such a kick out of a jury trial. So, okay, so let's move on to that then, Nemli. Could you tell us about your career? Would, would that be okay? And some of your some of your clients? Well, I was very lucky. I went into chambers um, in Three Hair Court where there were a small prosecution set. The head of chambers was the Conservative of Solicitor General, Sir Ian Percival. But our most important client as a set of chambers was the Scotland Yard solicitor. This was in the days before the CPS was set up. So the, the police did all their own prosecuting. And this only um, was changed after the, there was a, a case called the Confet case, which uh, caused a bit of a scandal because it appears that the Police and the prosecutors were far too close. But anyway, that's another story. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. At the well, start of your career, free hair court. Oh, yes. Um, the Scotland Yard solicitor wouldn't instruct women. So when I joined those chambers, I was told, fine, we'll take your rent, but you can't have any of the pool of chambers work. I wasn't even allowed to touch the 
traffic cases, you know, dangerous driving, that sort of thing, which was the bread and butter for the young members. Um, I was told, you know, uh, you have to fend for yourself. But one day I was very fortunate. I went in and the clerk said to me, uh, you do me a favor, pop down to Arbor Square Magistrates Court in the morning. Um, we've got a very important solicitor client, but he is of the Orthodox Jewish faith and he can't go to court on Saturday. So I duly went down to Arbor Square, which is an East End Magistrates Court. And there I met my first clients and they were Ronnie and Reggie Cray. And I managed to win this little, little, little case, unimportant case of being a suspected person, loitering with the intent to commit a crime. Um, but I, I won that. Or rather, I think the big men with scarred faces at the back of the court probably won it. But I thought us, the cat's whiskers as an advocate. Um, anyway, they were very pleased with me. And after that, I became the Saturday girl for this firm of solicitors. And the Crave brothers liked me and they kept on asking for me. So I did a number of cases for them. And then they started referring me to their various friends and protégés. Um, so I built my practice purely on that stroke of luck of being available on a Saturday. Wow. I find it really fascinating actually to think about the craze kind of gave you your big break in some ways. Yes. And they didn't see you as just a woman who didn't deserve to be there. They saw you as extremely capable and able to get them off, you know, these charges. And you did that. Yes, I mean, I, I never had any problems with them. They were very correct, very friendly, um, good as gold, as far as I was concerned. They were perfect clients. But they, one of the first cases they gave me was their little protege, well, not their huge protege, Frank Mitchell, who was known as the Mad Axeman. And uh, they, Ronnie, who was the dominant twin of the... Uh, the one who gave the orders, said, would you look after a, a, a little friend of ours? And he's in terrible trouble. And uh, so I duly went down and met him in one of present. And it was Frank Mitchell. Now, he was a tragic figure, really. He was about six foot four, um, very strong and broad. And he had a big, flat, beaming face, rather like a, um, a chap with a mild case of, of Down syndrome. And very simple. Um, but he had, at the age of 10, stolen a fairy cycle and had been sent to what in those days was called an industrial school. It's what we now call a young offenders institution at the age of 10, and he never came out again because he got into trouble there and uh, was sent then to Borstal. Then in Borstal, he got into trouble, was sent to prison. And by the time I met him, he must have been about 35 and he'd been incarcerated since the age of 10. And his family had given up on him. Uh, but the craze had sort of adopted him and they were very kind to him. And when I went down to see him, he was charged with attempted murder, the attempted murder of a fellow prison inmate. And the allegation was that he and the, the victim had been walking around on exercise in Wandsworth prison and the victim had suddenly fallen to the ground with the knife in his back, very badly injured. And Frank ran up the yard and disappeared. Well, he was duly charged with um, this attempted murder. But I went down to see him and I was very naughty. I took my little sister with me and said she was my pupil, but I thought it would be very good for her to 
meet a desperate criminal woman. She was an, a novice nun at the time, and I thought she should <laughs> see a bit of the work, real world. So anyway, um, when we got there, Frank simply refused to talk about his case. He, um, he said, oh, Ron and Reg sent you. They've been very good to me, you know. They gave me a lovely watch and, and a wireless. And they've been very kind to me. And now they sent me two lovely young ladies. And he took our hands, my, my sister's hand and my hand, and kissed them. <laughs> and Patty Packenham, who was the managing clerk from the firm of solicitors, was with me and said, oh, come off it, Frank. You can't marry them both, you know. <laughs> You've got some serious business to discuss. Anyway, um, in those days, committal proceedings, which are the way a criminal case starts, um, would had to be done with live witnesses. Nowadays, it's usually done as a paper exercise. You just get the witness statements. But in those days, they had to call all the witnesses. Anyway, we went down to Southwest London Magistrates Court, which is the court that deals with cases arising in Wandsworth. And um, the witnesses all retracted their statements. The, um, the first, the, the victim said, uh, I didn't say see nothing. Frank is huge, but his arm is. It wasn't him. Um, even the prison officers who had been present saying, well, uh, with hindsight, I can't be sure. And I thought the magistrate was going to go berserk, but um, he had to throw the case out. Now, this had nothing to do with my advocacy, I think. It was the presence of Ronnie and Reggie in the back of the court. They were there, but they behaved so well, they couldn't be ejected. Right. And after the hearing, this, this court is down in South London. I think it's uh, Ballum or somewhere. Ronnie said, um, can I give you a lift back? Nobody likes to be south of the river, do they? they? There's a terrible snobbery between North London people and South London people. I regret to say, living in Stoke Newington, we feel it a bit ourselves. But um, <laughs> anyway, so I accepted the lift along with the managing clerk, Paddy, and we drove back over the river and the craze white Jaguar, which had, was chauffeur driven, of course. Um, and on the way back, Ronnie said to me, mother would be highly honored if you'd come and take tea with us. And we drove back to uh, their house in Bethnal Green, which was known locally as Fort Valence. It was in Valence Road and went in and had tea with the Cray family. And how was that? How was it? It was bizarre. It, uh, tea was, um, you know, the craze of gypsies and the house was decorated in the style of a Romilly caravan with a beautifully clean and polished and velvet bows and lace curtains and horse brasses and red velvet wallpaper. And tea was uh, served upstairs in a room like a boardroom with a long table with a white lace tablecloth served by Violet, the mother, who came in with tea on a tray and there were a bone china tea set, cake on a stand, um, biscuits in a barrel. And Ronnie sat at one end of the table and Reggie at the other, and Charlie, the elder brother, um, sort of hovered around organizing the thing. And the various acolytes stood behind our chairs. And we sat down and we um, had the tea and made rather stilted conversation about the traffic in Mare Street and Whitechapel. And then suddenly Ronnie rose to his feet and said, Miss Lethbridge, I would like to thank you on behalf of one and all of the family 
for all your kindness to one and all of the family and to our dear friend Frank. Would you accept this with my compliments? And he handed me a great wadge of old white fibers. And I said, this is terribly kind of you, Mr. Craig, but I, I'm not allowed to accept money. You know, it's, um, but I know it's kindly meant. And I gave it back to him. And Reggie then said, Nitto, Ron, you know the rules. And the one said, oh, sorry, all out, all out. And uh, he said, I shouldn't have done that in front of witnesses. <laughs> and all the acolytes left. And he offered me the money again. And I said, I'm so sorry, I really can't take it. Um, but I do appreciate it. And he was really very puzzled. And um, anyway, he called the shirker to drive us back to the temple. And I said to Paddy, oh dear, I hope I haven't offended them and blown it with the craze. And Paddy said, oh, don't worry about that. I've arranged with them to get you a nice crocodile handbag and I'll work it down for you. And I said, I don't want a crocodile handbag. All I want is their work. Yes. But um, they weren't offended and they did continue to send their friends and colleagues to me to defend. Did you get the handbag, Nemini? No. No, no. no. <laughs> I was... I was very young, but I had enough instinctive common sense to know I mustn't get close. Yeah. I mean, what, okay, so what was the motive behind that? Was it just, in your mind, do you think it was just purely to kind of say, we really appreciate your efforts, or was there something a bit more sinister behind it, like we want to buy you kind of thing? I think they, uh, it was a bit of both. Right. Mm. They wanted, uh, was it what Lenin called a useful idiot? Right. Okay. And they did, in the end, find a useful idiot, uh, uh, another barrister. This was ages later, when after I'd left, and it was a terribly sad story because this chap had come up the hard way. He'd started as a barrister's clerk, and he'd worked very hard and done his exams, got himself called to the bar. And they liked his style and they were using him. And then one day they, they had a habit of meeting on Saturday morning in a, when they weren't in court, um, in a pub with their various chums. And on this occasion, they said to this fellow, um, oh, would you mind signing this passport application? Uh, Albert um, wants to go to Tangiers. That was the great place. Um, Say you've known him for 30 years. Well, I had met him, uh, that this chap had met him that morning for the first time, but he signed the passport application. And of course he was disbarred and that was the end of his... Uh... Gosh. But it is very, very dangerous yeah. to get too close. So that's it. That's the indication of perhaps the type of things they would have been asking you to do if you said yes, if you'd taken it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I know you've uh, recounted this story on TV, but I do love the story. And I wonder if you'd mind telling us about the Barbara Windsor <laughs> moment in court. Oh, um, I was asked to um, look after Ronnie Knight, who was uh, at that time a, a very sleek young East End gangster. And he was charged with robbing Lots Road Power Station and stealing a lot of money with with others, and it, the case was just started. And I was sent down to the Old Bailey to try and get him bail, because obviously he was remanded in custody. And it was very difficult to get bail in a serious case like that. And you have to pull out all the stops. And I, you have to show that the client is unlikely to abscond, that he's got, um, social ties in a stable life and you know all the rest of it and so i went about this you know he indulges in charitable activities he's got a stable family he's married to a famous actress and at that time this wasn't known 
And the guys in the press gallery went absolutely berserk. Um, and, you know, within five minutes of leaving the court, they had found out that it was Barbara. And I didn't get bail, of course. But anyway, she came up to me in the street outside the obedient. She said, you fucking little cow. After this, you won't, uh, why did you say that? After this, you won't be able to sell me uh, with a pound of sugar in this business. What did you say? Well, I was a bit shocked. I thought I'd done my best. But um, in fact, it didn't do her any harm. After that, you know, the press loved her and thought she was a gallant little Dolly Parton who stood by her man. <laughs> well, I just love that story. She became a sort of national treasure, which she remained. She did okay. <laughs> she did. <laughs> but she watched the bold Ronnie. Um, he got acquitted on that occasion and he took off to Spain and married another lady, so it was rather ungrateful of him. <laughs> So after you married Jimmy, can you tell us what happened after that and your time in Greece? You, you said that you had to go, well, you weren't allowed to practice at the bar anymore because of your marriage. Yes. Um, well, at first we, we knew that there was likely to be trouble with the uh, tabloid press if we got married. So we got married in Ireland so there wouldn't be anything in the public record office here, because at that time the press were more squeamish mm. than they are now, and they wouldn't write that they knew we were living together, but if they could have found a, something in writing that confirmed this, then they could have written the story. And we managed to keep our marriage under wraps for three years. But, you know, by behaving very discreetly. But uh, we actually got married in Dublin. And um, then it was strange. My sister came out of the convent. She was no longer a novice. And she married a young clergyman. She met in the course of her duties as a nun. So this was a bit of a story in itself. And there was a small item in the Sunday Telegraph about Cherry's marriage. And just in passing said among the guests were Jimmy and Lemon. And after that, of course, you could no longer uh, keep the, the hounds off our back. And um, I was very upset because I didn't want my mother to have to deal with the paparazzi. And so I said, well, come on, let's uh, go to Greece. We'll take you out of the line of fire for a bit. And she and I went to Greece and we did an archaeological tour of the Peloponnese. And Jimmy came and joined us. And when I got back, it was extraordinary. Uh, we'd seen no newspapers and we'd um, had no radio but when we got back the bear pigs had happened and we realized that in our absence the world had nearly come to an end it really was eerie and also there was a letter from the head of chambers lying on my doormat which said dear nebony i have today instructed the clerks to return your rent and to remove your name from the door because i could no longer risk compromising the reputation of Chambers. And so that was that as far as Hair Court was concerned. I went round the temple and tried to find other Chambers without success. I really, I, you know, my name was Dirt. Uh, and finally I thought, well, I'll go and see Gerald Gardner, who at that time was the Labour Lord Chancellor. And I thought he's a nice, enlightened fellow. Maybe he will take me. And he was charming. And he uh, said, oh, Emily, I rather admire what you've done. I think it's quite brave. And I do wish you every happiness and good luck. But I'm afraid I can't offer you a place in chambers because we don't accept women. 
<laughs> Extraordinary. So that was it. And so in disgust, I was thinking of Lord Byron after he'd been um, involved in scandal, how he shook the dust of this country off his feet and went to Albania, actually. But, um, so off we went and we set up home in Greece because at that time air travel was very cheap and we could virtually commute back to London. So it didn't interfere with uh, Jimmy's work for the Wednesday play. It only cost something like 69 pounds to fly to Athens. So this was a perfectly possible way of life. But I couldn't get Chambers, get back for 18 years, by which time the climate had changed, thank God. Yeah. And, and how did you find the difference in that 18 years? Oh, it was a completely different world when I got back. Um, I joined the set, I was invited to join the set of chambers run by a man called Louis de Pinna, who was a chancery barrister, and he was an old fashioned liberal with a capital L. And he took black men in his chambers and women. And he offered me a place. And it was astonishing. The first time I went to court, I saw black faces everywhere and girls. It was really, it was wonderful. <laughs> and can you remember what your first case was when you went back? Yes, I can. It was a very silly case. There was a, a woman who actually we knew she lived in this area and she was a fanatical old fashioned Catholic. And she objected to Vatican II. And she had thrown a pot of paint over the cardinal. <laughs> <laughs> I was sent out to defend this crazy lady. And were you successful? Oh, they gave her a slap on the wrist. I think no, the, nobody knew what to do with her because she was obviously deranged. <laughs> and that time you spent in Greece, I believe you've written about, is that right? Yes, we were the, We had a house there for thirty years, oh, wow. and um, it was wonderful. At that time, I mean, we were on Mykonos, which at that time really was the earthly paradise. It was completely unspoiled. Now it's very different, mm. but um, in those days it was perfect. But there were two boats a week to Athens, and that was it. So there was no mass tourism. There were just, because um, Mykonos is next to a famous archeological site on Delos, there were always sort of academics and archeologists and people like that, but no mass tourism. Mm -hmm. Then they got a daily, daily boat to the mainland and things started to change. And then they built an airstrip, and that was it. And now the flight's direct to Dubai. Mm. And it's a totally different world. Have you got any work coming out on that period of time? Lemmy, are you writing about that currently? Or? Well, I'm doing the second volume of my autobiography. Okay. When, when are you looking to publish? Oh, it's got a long way to go. I'm struggling because there isn't a kind of. Um, obvious narrative, it's more anecdotes. Mm -hmm. But um, there's still some interesting stuff, I think, I hope. Well, well, given how fascinating your anecdotes always are, I'm sure the book will be a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, but... We, we've, still, we've got a few, a few more photographs. Uh, maybe it's worth kind of pulling up, uh, if I just get those back up again. Um... Uh, that is Jimmy. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Emily, you are beautiful. You really are. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> you are. I saw myself in the glass this week and I thought I looked like Miss Havisham. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. At all. But I am 91. You're amazing. Oh, wow.
And, and that's with your, with your friends at the bottom there. <laughs> yes. Do you keep in touch with the relatives with, with the Cray family now? I'm godmother to Charlie's daughter. Oh, right. He's oh. the, elder, the eldest brother. Oh, so that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, she's a lovely person, isn't she? Yeah, she's really nice. Nancy, Nancy Cray. And she's uh, in no way criminal. I and mean, mm. she, she makes uh, Fabergé eggs. Oh, she wow. She's handcrafts. Lovely. Yes, she's a nice woman. Oh, there you are. That's uh, Jimmy and me at Cherry's wedding, my sister's wedding. That's when your the discovery was made. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Are there? And is that in Greece? That yes. That's on Mykonos. That's yes. right. Yes. Jimmy was so happy in Mykonos. Uh, that was our first house, and our cat. Aww. But um, he just, he was completely on the wavelength of the the old boys, the old fishermen and people. And he, um, he just integrated so well into that community. Mm. He loved it and they, they loved him. Mm. They called him Mr. Jim. What was really interesting was the fact that, um, because of course, Greece had been occupied during the Second World War, they all had war stories. And, um, you know, they had, many of his friends had been in the, so I think there was some commonality of experience. Yeah. And um, there were some great stories. And, you know, I remember him pointing across when we were kids and say, those guys over there, they were, they were the Greek resistance and they, they recaptured the lighthouse one night and oh. uh, killed the guards. It was, yes. God, they, you know, they, there were some characters. They were, and uh, we had great friends. Uh, well, actually, an American academic married to a Greek lady, and she had been in the resistance in Athens in the war. And she used to push, um, she had a baby at the time. She used to take messages for the, um, the resistance through German lines in the baby's neck. Yeah. We, we were just reading about a case, weren't we, Paul? I think he was five years old. He's the youngest yeah. uh, member of the resistance that, that died in France. And they used to sew in messages inside his coat and things like that. Yes. And uh, yes. But funnily enough, when you were talking about Jimmy and his wartime and his life, um, I just feel like his personality would have really lent itself to resistance to say SOE, you know, Okay, languages aside, but he would have been so useful, I think, in that role. Yes, yes, you're right. But they um they really loved him on the island, mm -hmm. didn't they? they... And, and the war was such a kind of commonality then between people because yes. you know it was as if it was the only war. They often, I mean, my father always just said the war, my grandparents just said the war. Uh, they never said the Second World War, and, and you know, they both all of them have been affected by the first one way or another. But everywhere you went, there was this connection, and, and particularly obviously within Europe. So I can, I can see why he probably got on so well with these people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And there, there was a gratefulness Lovely. amongst them because of the, the Allies. Oh yes, I mean they're, they're very pro-British, mm. and they still remember Lord Byron. <laughs> Which is extraordinary. I mean, their streets mm. carrying the the name Byron, and you know, they they have long memories, and they remember the fact mm. that he helped them get rid of the Turks. Mm. I think this is a great photograph. When I look at that, I, I see you know someone of his background standing there in a BBC studio holding a BBC camera, when so many of his kind of peers in that same environment were not from the back, same background as him. I think that's what makes this really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, it's a wonderful photograph. And he he did so well. He was uh, so successful on, on any measure. You know, three case signs getting 13 and a half million. And um, Bob Hoskins got his first break with my dad. So, you know, he very much discovered Bob Hoskins, uh, Derek Griffiths, um, uh, and John Binden. John Binden was a 
you know, is a, a, a massive character. Anyone who doesn't know who John Binder is, Google him. He's a <laughs> quite a character. But um, yeah, it was um, Her Majesty's Pleasure was Bob Hoskins first show and it's still a, an incredible play. I think that was his best play. Yeah. I think so. that that's a, a play that was set entirely in Broadmoor. Mm. And though it wasn't a BBC play, it was was Granada, it Granada? Yeah. Yes. And it had Bob Hoskins, John Binden, and, and Derek Griffiths. And um we'll have to see if we can get that available for people because it's it's amazing. Yes, I, I really think it was mm. his very best play. Good to look at that. I grew up um, with Broadmoor, not far from where we lived, and every Monday they would play the siren, the escape, um, the, the, sorry, the escape alarm, and then we would have to wait for the all clear. So every Monday we'd be at school, and you'd hear the. I think it went <laughs> when someone had escaped, and then being up, being up when they all. Oh, I might have been the other way round, but I remember as children we'd all sort of go, "No one's escaped," and. Um, <laughs> I remember one time when I was probably about eight or nine and somebody had escaped and, and when they'd come over the wall, they uh, sprained their ankles. So they managed to stay out for about two or three days on the run. Um, and they were they were found in the field next to our house in the tree. Um, and I used to be able, we, we used to get sent over to the fields to play and, you know. <laughs> wow. And my next door neighbour was a nurse and she was one of the people that treated him for his ankle. Um, but yeah, and, and I always remember my uh, my nanny Lulu, who was from London, lived in Chiswick. Um, they were offered a council house in uh, Bracknell, which is near Broadmoor, and she refused to go because she said it's near Broadmoor. So she stayed in London. Um, but yeah, so it's funny. I'd quite like to quite like to see that. I went to tea with Ronnie in Broadmoor. Yes, I remember. Can you tell us about that? And if you're not, you know, if we're not taking up too much time, what was that like? Well, it was it was uh, bizarre again. Um, I think even more bizarre than Fourth Balance. I I went um, with a a Stoke Newington character called Puffing Billy, who was an old bookmaker's runner runner from the area, and Ronnie had after his conviction, his thirty years. Of course, he really stayed in prison, but Ronnie was sent to. Broadmoor, because really he was mad as a march hair. But um, he sent me a Christmas card every year, right up to the time of his death, mm. always posted on the 29th of October, because he'd like to make certain that yeah. his cards got around. <laughs> um, I think he bought them in bulk. Anyway, we went down to Broadmoor to tea, and when we arrived, Ronnie had a butler. And this chap in a white jacket, who was a, another Broadmoor patient, we don't call them prisoners, he said, uh, would you prefer um, China, a Sam, Earl Grey, or PG Tips? <laughs> and then in we went and uh, tea was served in a common or dining room. And in came Ronnie. By this time, he, um, he was very fat. When I first knew the twins, they were identical, but uh, by the time of their big trial, they looked quite different because Reggie was very thin and nervous. Ronnie, because of the medication, the antipsychotic medication he was taking, he got very fat and he looked rather like the Queen Mother. But um, anyway, we sat down to tea and um, he said, shall I pour? He was very nice. And then he started asking me to help with the appeal of some of his little protégés. You know. um, he, he always had a reason for his hospitality. But then um, he said, would you like a meat pie? They will warm them up lovely. And offered us a meat pie. Uh, and then at the end of tea, he, um, he gave me a teddy bear, which he'd made himself. And a painting of a gypsy caravan, which he'd done himself, which was absolutely awful. I mean, he had no talent as an artist, I'm afraid. But um, I gave it to Nancy, mm. uh, his niece, and she treasures it. Of course, yeah. 
but it was a very interesting uh, tea party. It's quite what I find interesting about that is quite a lot of films start off with that idea of the the very well-known, respected criminal in prison with the butler and being served steak and red wine. And it, as you just said, it's kind of true. It's bizarre, isn't it? And, you know, he ran up a bar bill <laughs> while he was in Broadmoor. And we have a, another fr friend uh, who was Violet's hairdresser, a woman called Maureen Flanagan, who's written a book uh, called One of the Family about her association with the tree. And um, she said she went to visit uh, Ronnie on one occasion with other members of the family. And she, they were approached by somebody rather embarrassed, saying, you know, Ronnie's bar bill is really getting out of hand. Do you think you could settle it? And he'd run up a bar bill of 7,000 pounds. Has he been drinking? Whatever it was, it was the best. <laughs> yeah. okay. Should we ask any if there were any questions um, from anyone? Cool. Yes, yes, and, and we've also got the uh, the film to show. We could show that as a should kind of. A... The, should we do the film first then? Yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Milo. Uh, about yeah, about. I'd love to. Um, my eldest nephew, Kit O'Connor, has. Um, He's a young filmmaker, very, very unmakingly proud of him. He's a very talented guy. And in his third year at Goldsmiths, in his film degree, he made a film about my dad and mum, and it's called Condemned. It's about his case. Um, it's only seven minutes long, so it's a short film, but it's remarkably good. And uh, it gives the story in a nutshell. Right, okay. So we'll put that. Seven. Yeah. We'll try and get that to work now. So that's fantastic. Go. Here we go. So. You got sound? No sound? No sound. Still no sound. There's no sound? Yeah, no sound. Oh, okay, that's bizarre. It worked before. Okay, I'm going to just try that again. Mm -hmm. It might be one of those technical things. Modern technology. Oh, hello. <sighs> um... Still no sound? No, unfortunately not. Um... Uh, blast. Hmm, I wonder why it worked before and doesn't now. Yeah. It worked in rehearsal. <laughs> it did. Uh, maybe because we're recording. Might be might ah. be to do with that. Well, what we'll do instead, we'll put uh we'll put it in the show notes so there's a link yeah. to it so people can uh can can have a look at that. I mean, is it worth watching without the sound for now, Milo? Um not really because it's a narrative. Oh, there is, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's commentary, okay. Okay. Oh, so it's a it's a great little film, so I recommend people do have a have a look. Yeah, I I watched it a couple of times last night. I thought it was excellent. Uh, you know, really nicely shot and um, the way it kind of links everything together. It's fan fabulous. Yeah, fabulous. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> I, hope, I hope they've got an excellent career in filmmaking ahead of them. Absolutely. Well, we're going to try and he's going to try and get funding to do it properly. So, um, oh, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. So we, we've still got a few people tuned in, apart, apart from us here. I don't know if any, anyone's got any kind of questions that they want to put up in the chat box, which we can uh, um, answer. Um, so that's at the bottom of your screen. There's a little chat box there. You can put a question in. So if you've got a question, by all means, pop one in there. But I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion i mean I, honestly i think that, you know victoria's right we could kind of need to record everything you say in Emily, because it, it's just, there's not there's not a, an unfascinating element in anything that you you've ever said so it's, it's just extraordinary really thank you uh, it, it, it's funny we haven't even covered the fact that mum's legal career goes right back again to world war ii 
because you, your dad was the head of intelligence in Berlin after the war and was collecting, gathering the evidence for the Nuremberg trials. And that's how you got your first pupillage, wasn't it? Yes. Um, I was the chief prosecutor for the English team at Nuremberg was David Kilmuir, who became Lord Chancellor. And his junior was Mervyn Griffith Jones. And um, when I was called to the bar, Kilmuir, who became quite a chum of my dad, asked um, Mervyn whether he would take me as a pupil. And that's how I got my first pupil, which was very, very difficult to get. Yeah. I was lucky in that. I mean, I had a couple of lucky breaks. And then, of course, I blew it. <laughs> well, you didn't blow it. The, the system completely yeah. Yeah. disrespected yes. you for the, you know, as we've all, we know about. But I mean, it, I mean, it's the same. I think about my career in the police. I came up against the exactly the same, exactly the same, my gender, then my marital status, then having children, et cetera. And that's, mm. that's in the 2000s. So, yeah. Yeah, I think in a way, Nemin, it was just absolutely stacked against you. And, and what you have achieved, in spite of all of that, is absolutely astonishing. Thank you. I, I, I think... forgot to tell you one amusing story about Jimmy. And that is when he was in Parkhurst, he got a job as, as the governor's valet, which gave him access to the governor's office. And... At the same time as he was there, there were a lot of the old official IRA members in prison with him. And they had a very hard time because every time they moved prison, they were beaten up by the staff. And um, they had a, well, it happened all the time. They were you know, regarded as the worst possible scum, mm. rather like pedophiles today. But anyway, um, Jimmy had access to the governor's office. And on Saturday afternoon, the governor used to um, go and watch football. And Jimmy had free reign at his office and no supervision. So he found the records of the IRA men. He took them out and he burned them. And after that, of course, he was punished and sent back to Dartmoor. But he was made an honorary member of the old IRA. And when that's nothing to do with the um, the the provost, this yeah. is the old officials mm. who are long gone now. Mm. But um, when he was in his last years, he was living in a convent very close to this house in Stoke Newton, which is run by nuns, and it's um, part care home, part nursing home. He'd had a very severe stroke, and so he was pretty disabled. And one day, two old IRA guys turned up to visit him. And I remember them very well, two old boys from the Isle of Wight. And after their release from prison, they'd gone back to Ireland, and they thought they'd get a hero's welcome, but in fact, they didn't. They'd been forgotten and ignored, and there was no work. So a lot of them came back to England and two of them settled in Hackney locally. One of them by this time was a Hackney councillor. And I remember him, he was called Jerry Lawless and he had only one eye. And I remember them going into Jimmy's room and them all sort of embracing each other, swapping anecdotes about Jolly Japes and the Isle of Wight. <laughs> oh. So that, that's the reason why Jimmy got sent back for that for that offence, yes. burning the records. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah, he really did take it, you know, he, he took it upon himself to help them, but there was a price. Yes. <laughs> wonder they never forgot him. So, so we've got no questions, but two comments uh, in the chat. One from Gina Weir. No questions, really, but just to say how much I've appreciated this. Nemini, what wonderful stories. I knew much of the story from Jimmy. In his book, but your perspective brings so much to light. That's um, nice. Dear Gina. <laughs> and, and then Paul Levy says, Thank you, Nemini and Milo. Hope you're both all good. Great listening and hope to catch up soon.
so there we are well thank you no thank, thank you very thank much you. thank you both i mean I, I just kind of i look at your life and what an extraordinary life from stepping into hitler's bunker at the end <laughs> of the second world war through to having tea uh in a high security prison <laughs> with one of the crazes. it's quite quite an extraordinary and everything else in between it's quite extraordinary and, and jimmy's life too you know i think it's maybe it's time for a Jimmy O'Connor kind of retrospective in terms of his work coming back to, to the public eye again. I think so. I think you're quite right. So let's hope so. And yeah. also a film <laughs> about Nemini's life. I mean, oh, yes. what an amazing film that would be. Let's start writing the script for that. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, and as an exclusive, Nemini, who, who would you get to play you in the film? Oh, blimey. <laughs> <laughs> Not Barbara Windsor. <laughs> Not Barbara Windsor, no, no. So there we are. Let's hope for that one. So I think we'll kind of wrap it up there, I think. Uh, thank you very much. It's well, lovely to see you. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you both so much. It's been excellent. It was great. Thank you. Really yeah, enjoyed it. Thank you. It's been fascinating. I mean, you know, what a what a fantastic couple of recordings that we've we've done with you now. So thank you so much. Thank you to those who've joined us and thank you to those who will watch this subsequently on YouTube. And here's to the next time we talk history with Humphreys and Reed. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.